Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ronaldo Lemos, and I would like to invite our distinguished panelists to actually join us. Uh, please, yes. Will it be considered product placement if I drink this? It's it's okay. Yeah. Very good. So, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. I'll be the moderator. I'm from Brazil. And uh, I would like to quickly introduce our guests. Uh, we have a very interesting panel for this afternoon session. And I'd like to start by introducing Burak Arikan. I hope you pronounce it correctly. Uh, Burak is with the Alternative Informatics. He's also an artist. Uh, working with software art, uh, among other things, I, I presume. And we also have Oksana Romaniuk. Uh, she is with the Mass Information Institute from Ukraine. Uh, we also have with us Richard Luzimbo. He is uh, with the Sexual Minorities Research Manager, uh, SMUG, and he's going also uh, to talk with us. And then we have Andreas... Aspurua from Venezuela. Uh, I didn't get the institution you were with. Venezuela Inteligentes. Okay, so it's called Venezuela Inteligentes, a uh, local NGO. And actually, as you can see, these are countries that have been in the news uh, recently for various reasons. And I think the main interest of this panel is actually to get an inside perspective of what's going on and specifically, what is the role of technology uh, in order to cope with the different issues that we will be hearing through this panel. So I wonder if some of you have actually read the very interesting piece on The Economist magazine recently uh, about the context of democracy uh, nowadays. And it's actually a very interesting piece, especially when they mention that one of the symptoms of democracies failing their purposes is actually when you see minorities being disrespected and civil liberties being undermined. So basically, I think in this panel, we will hear about some of the stories that actually talk and address uh, these particular issues. And I am from Brazil, and Brazil is right on the verge of taking very important decisions in terms of the law so Brazil is basically about to vote a law next week, which is called the Marco Civil. It's a bill of rights for the internet. And actually, some of the, the issues that we will be discussing is actually very important for countries like Brazil and many others in order to take position and make decisions about how the internet and technology should play a role, especially in connection to civil liberties. So I'm very glad to be the moderator uh, of this panel. So uh, let's start. Uh, I will ask Richard to go first. So let's keep uh, uh, the presentations, our, our talks, as short as we can so that we can get the participation uh, of the audience. And then we can start a conversation among ourselves. This conversation can go directly from one another. It doesn't have to be coming to me all the time. So please feel free to actually make comments and ask questions to each other directly if you'd like to. So Richard, please. Thank you very much, Ronaldo, for uh, taking us through this. Uh, just as was introduced, I'm Richard Lusimba from Sexual Minorities Uganda, SMUG. SMUG is an LGBT organization that advocates for LGBT rights in Uganda. But until the 20th, uh, 24th of February, uh, we're legally, officially declared illegal in our very own country uh, when the president uh, signed the anti-homosexuality bill and a lot of pomp and glamour before uh, cameras and uh, leading news uh, agencies. Uh, this law decrim uh, criminalizes the work that we do. Uh, my organization, the work that we do would be uh, taken as promotion of homosexuality. So that would mean that I could be uh, sentenced to jail between 7 to 14 years and uh, it also communalizes people who are gay in uh, communities that could lead to a life sentence. So basically, the time or the 
the space for us to operate has been reduced uh, by this kind of law. And the media, uh, different sect uh, of the media have taken up this and are promoting hate and discrimination. Uh, from the time the president signed the bill, the following day, one of the tabloids called Red Paper went ahead to publish what it called the top homos, the top homos, 200 top homos in Uganda. And it published people's names and pictures, exposing them to a very homophobic society and a society that is ready to actually attack and kill. And this has been going on uh, for the whole week. And different, they're taking a different dimension every other day that is passing and making it so difficult for LGBTI people to live even in their own communities. We've seen uh, youth, we've seen uh, people who have been uh, banished from their homes, who have been disowned because of this kind of law and because of this kind of uh, homophobia that is being promoted by the media. Uh, on Friday, I was meant to travel here, but I couldn't leave because on Friday, I was on the top page or the cover page of a tabloid as top homo, and the headline was how I became homo. So basically saying that no one is born gay, and no one is actually is the way they are because they were born that way. So creating a lot of fear, and this was a, it created a lot of backlash. I could not travel, I could not leave my, uh, the house, I had to stay indoors, and this creates a lot of... Uh, uh, of, um, of fear, and I'm not the only one who's going through this fear. It's the entire community uh, of the LGBTI people in Uganda. We have been isolated in our very own country. We have been uh, persecuted in our very own country. It makes it so hard to go to a supermarket to buy or shop our groceries because you're already pinned up there as someone who's not wanted in your very own community. And we've seen this going on and on, and it's actually being promoted by people who call themselves the champions of uh, Christianity, the champions of, uh, of belief and faith. People who claim, who are using actually the pulpit to preach hate and discrimination. So basically, these people, that, the evangelicals have a very big uh, following in Uganda. Given the fact that most of our population is poor, the evangelicals in the mid-70s and 80s uh, we had a civil war and then we had the HIV AIDS scourge and that's the time they came into the country and have established themselves and they're using this, they're using uh, their influence to promote what they're calling recruitment. Uganda before no one was talking about promotion and recruitment but through the evangelicals we are seeing that this is being promoted because they are saying they get a lot of money from western countries to come and promote homosexuality, to come and recruit your children. And this kind of uh, talk and uh, connotation has created a lot of fear and a lot of hatred. We are being banished and we are being uh, 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 persecuted even in our own countries because of this kind of uh, contention and preaching by the evangelicals. They have actually also taken on to use uh, social media to persecute us. Uh, for example, we've had different pages on uh, Facebook that have been used to out people. And uh, this, uh, because there's so many people who are on Facebook in Uganda, uh, so it was, uh, it's been very difficult for people to actually also use social media because they're scared uh, to be outed. We've seen uh, the, 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 uh, the internet has been the only source for us to reach out to the international world and other parts of uh, the country. But this space is being reduced every passing day. Uh, our websites have been hacked and shut down several times. But then, the fear also about the internet is, while we are using uh, the internet to preach or send out our message, the same internet is being used by uh, the anti-groups to actually uh, persecute us. I'll give an example of, um, we did a very good piece with the advocate and it was a very good advocacy piece whereby uh, different uh, LGBTI people in Uganda were not talking anything about rights or anything about politics. 
but basically they were sharing the rest of the world for who they are and what they do in a daily basis. This was a very good piece to share out there. And it was uh, put on the, on the web. But the red paper, after the signing of the anti-homosexuality bill, the red paper picked the same piece and turned it around and used it against us. So while the internet has been a very good uh, opening ground for us to advocate for our rights and reach out and send a word out there, it's in, within the same space that we are seeing a lot of discrimination, uh, a lot of persecution being used. And uh, we cannot abandon using the internet because it's the only hope that we have. But the only appeal we have or we make is how can we remain uh, using the internet but in a secure way? How can we devise means to continue communicating yet we are safe and actually we protect those that we advocate for as we fight to also actually take this anti-homosexuality bill in the constitutional court to challenge its uh, unconstitutionality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Aksana, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Aksana Romanyuk. I'm from Ukraine, uh, NGO, Institute of Mass Information. We defend freedom of speech, the right of citizens to information. And uh, I wanted to talk at first about the situation in my country. A week ago, we were very happy because we managed to throw away really corrupted government of President Yanukovych. People were standing for three months uh, under real frost, uh, freezing temperatures on the streets. And during these three months, journalists were targeted, civic activists were targeted, people were killed, hundreds of people were killed. And, but during these three months, a civic society was born in Ukraine. Grassroots communities were born in Ukraine. And, uh, you know, uh, the situation, uh, even in autumn, was uh, very difficult. Uh, there was a lot of censorship in official media. And uh, internet for us, it was the only open space where people could get information from. And this internet was also used against us, as um, my colleague has said. Uh, for instance, uh, they uh, broke emails of famous journalists, human rights activists, and exposed that uh, in the internet. Uh, my own uh, laptop was broken, all files were stolen. It was my home laptop, and it was exposed in the internet on a specially created website. Uh, and, of course, it was edited to show that as if I work for uh, Washington and, you know, uh, fulfilling orders uh, to press pr uh, local government. Uh, but we managed to throw it away. And now we are facing new challenges. Uh, Putin has occupied Crimea and Russian troops are standing along the eastern coast eastern border of Ukraine. Russian aircraft trespass the Ukrainian airspace and right now we have a kind of frozen conflict in Crimea and we do not know how it will develop in future, whether there will be a real war. We are trying to keep calm and dignity and not to respond to provocations and there are a lot of provocations. And the war is being carried out in the informational space. There is a real war at two levels. First, Crimea is cut off from communication. Russian uh, soldiers cut off uh, terrestrial uh, telephone communication. Uh, local operator Ukrtelecom was cut off. They cut off three uh, local TV stations through providers. They blocked access to Facebook, uh, to social networks, to uh, news channels like BBC News Channel. And people have problems with getting real information. 
Russian soldiers stop uh, correspondents uh, on roads and uh, just tell them to go away, otherwise they will be shot. And uh, even this morning I watched TV news here in San Francisco and I saw one and the same correspondent on different channels, like five channels I was um, switching and the same person was uh, speaking the same news. This is wrong. Crimea should not be isolated. We need journalists there. We need human rights activists there to arrive and to check and to tell the world what is happening there. To tell the world that uh, no uh, Russian citizens suffered. That um, everything, uh, well, to, to show the real information and we are ready to support. Ukrainian journalists are ready to help to uh, a company to show, uh, to, to provide any kind of support. The second level of informational war is uh, much bigger, is that uh, Russia is spreading a lot of fake news and false information uh, fake pictures, fake videos, uh, they are trying to show that uh, Ukrainians are fascists and they are trying to find any grounds to, any excuses to this invasion. Uh, to this, I don't know how crazy Putin plans, he is believed, uh, believing that he is the second Napoleon or I don't know, what is his plan actually. So. Um, it is very important to, um, first of all, we have two target groups, journalists and uh, human rights activists. We have uh, to provide those groups with information, build information channels, uh, provide any support. This is uh, really very important. And we have to prevent bloody conflict. We have to prevent massacre. We... Um, are resisting those provocations and believe me right now this is an ordeal for us but right now a real nation is building in my country you know that ukraine actually is divided into two parts uh, russian speaking west uh, east and ukrainian speaking west and it was a big surprise for putin I guess uh, when they uh, invaded into Ukraine, people were not meeting them with flowers. People do not need Putin because uh, spe to speak Russian language doesn't mean to support Putin. People perfectly understand what is Putinism. And right now in the eastern oblasts of Ukraine, anti-Maidan and pro-Maidan people are uniting forces against the Russian invasion. Right now, people, Russian speaking, Ukrainian speaking, are coming to understanding that they are Ukrainian citizens. They have to defend their country. Uh, and right now, a special group was created, working group, to have all laws in place to respect all national minorities at a proper level to develop a special ethic code to respect all languages. And right now, even oligarchs from the team of former president, they came to the new government and proposed their resources from uh, financial to influence in their regions to support the integrity of Ukraine. For us, it is very important to um, remain safe, to not allow blood, to keep our country. Uh, we threw away those corruption. We have absolutely new government. Our economics minister is traveling by subway to his work and it's absolutely, I just can't tell you, uh, maybe you saw in the news the mansion, luxury mansion of previous president, which is covered with gold and just 140 hectares of gold and with tigers in his zoo. And it gives us a hope. We have civic society. 
now we are building integrity and the support of international community is very important for us now and not only for us and for the whole world not to allow another world war not to allow another bloody conflict in the world thank you thank you Roxana um, later I want to go back to you to understand better how they exposed your information and your data because I think that's a cautionary tale for many activists around the yeah. world but we can follow up on that later so Burak please yeah. um. Hi, uh, my name is Brock Arikan. Uh, I'm an artist um, working with software and internet in general, and also working with um, you know uh, this alternative informatics association in Istanbul. Um, we work uh, usually we advise uh, governments and stuff. Also, uh, gather together other NGOs to kind of create a solidarity against the internet censorship and surveillance in general. Um, so, as you may know, in Turkey, just recently, two, three weeks ago, a new law, an internet law, just passed. It's February 19th. Um, and this law is very interesting. Like, it is like, just to make it simply, you know, it is, you can think of NSA, uh, the, 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 let's say, covered op operations of NSA, surveillance and stuff, mass surveillance in U.S. This is equivalent to that. It's like being... Uh, legal, legalizing the, internet, the NSA activities in Turkey, let's say. That's that level, that deep. So what does that mean? If you go into it a bit, um, you'll find, for instance, uh, surveillance of you know, the whole population, like every single person, and, and also uh, quite deep censorship. Um, these two uh, you know, major let's say, axes of, of uh, control of internet is uh, uh, just allowed by the new internet law. And this has come with a lot of uh, technical difficulties, but also quite, uh, uh, let's say, heavy-handed uh, you know, uh, operations. Uh, I think like enfor law enforcement operations. So, for instance, technically speaking, uh, if you think about the, you know, the Censorship was being done before uh, just on DNS, like domain names uh, level, and IP level. Now, the, with this new law, it will be done through the uh, URL. So that means any object on the internet, like a media file, a video, uh, an account on Twitter or something, can be banned uh, within Turkey. So you cannot access from Turkey to this account, uh, or this file, or this website, or whatever. Um, so and to be able to do this, such a survey, uh, such a censorship, you should apply a technology called deep packet uh, inspection, as you may know about it, DPI. Um, this is a very, like, quite hard technology itself, like to be able to run some, a system like that. Um, so, to be able to do such, uh, to enable such technology, of course, what Turkey does is basically goes out and outsource this process, this operation to. Uh, existing commercial systems, which are also, as you may know, ba uh, uh, you know, uh, provided by the U.S. and U.K.-based um, companies. Um, so Turkey becomes a kind of, uh, you know, the maybe a major client of those companies, the surveillance companies in, in U.S. Um, so. <clears throat> The other things, the other uh, story is that the, the there's a new uh, organization founded by the government called ISP Unions, if I translate it correctly into English. Uh, it's a, an official organization by the government, and the government requires every ISP to be part of it, to be a member of this organization. And then this, or, this union will mandate, basically, uh, all these surveillance and censorship policies, and they will have to do that. You know, the, the ISPs, they will be required to do all these policies, apply those policies. And it will require them to make new investments, obviously. And as a result of that, you will have uh, a monopoly. Like all these small, we have like around 250 ISPs in Turkey. And only one of them dominates 75% of the market. And as a result of that, 
major or, or most of the Attic ISPs will be bankrupted or they will have to leave the market and only few of them will left. So there will be a, even more domination of the uh, ISP in the ISP level. Um, so these are some stories from the law. Like there are some more details that we can talk later on maybe. Um, but the rush of the government to pass this law this quickly without too much discussion, without too much discussing of you know, what is it its consequences and stuff. Um, the reason for this rush is that uh, the, the recent leaks that were revealed uh, about the government in Turkey, like, which is, uh, which basically, this is like around December 17th, which showed that the government was highly corrupted. Uh, the, for instance, the, as an example of how corrupt is that, the, the sons of the Minister of Economy, the Minister of uh, um, Urban Transformation, the Minister of um, uh, interior, you know, in general, uh, their sons were uh, kind of, uh, by the prosecutors, they were captured from their homes and they found lots of, like, millions of cash in boxes and stuff. And this was also, it became immediately a, of a topic of a protest, of course, like a joke as well. But at the same time, it was a, you know, a dramatic um, um, uh, story. Um, so, and leaks after leaks, like almost every two, three weeks, we found out these leaks on the web, on the internet. And of course, government was highly, uh, you know, concerned about that. And then they tried always to uh, protect uh, those files to reach the masses. Um, of course, what people do in Turkey right now, the both civic and you know, both on the streets and on the on the internet, um, they basically, uh, whatever, whenever they find such leaks they basically distribute that to the masses in all ways, using like the existing newspapers, like hacking, uh, you know, existing popular websites, or uh, just, you know, putting things on the streets, on the, on the public transportation, you know, everywhere. So people find ways of uh, basically disseminating such information about the government and, and their corrupted politics. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we can maybe talk about later of these type of, you know, what type of resistance exists against government censorship and surveillance. Um, I will just cut short here and, and leave it to you, maybe. We'll come back to that uh, a little bit later. So, Andres, can you give us your account about the Venezuela issue? Well, in Venezuela, with a very limited amount of independent media willing to cover protests or other damaging reports, especially the lack of real-time information coming from news agencies or news television networks. There are actually no, currently there's actually no television network willing to cover protests in real time. And mo most of the time they just don't mention whatever is going on if it's damaging. This has been an issue for the last few years, but it has become to a complete lack of information on TV. Printed media is not printing, it's practically with, without printing anything. They're just limiting themselves in the amount of pages they can print because the government is not allowing them to import newspaper. Without the paper, they cannot keep printing. So the, 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 the printed media is actually in the situation whether they have to limit heavily whatever they, ha whatever they can publish on, on the newspapers or maybe comply with the government and hope that that way they'll be allowed to import newspapers so they can keep printing their traditional sized newspapers. This lack of information, especially the lack of real-time information, has led Venezuelans to inform themselves mostly online, especially via social media. This has many, fought, uh, many, fault, many pitfalls that are common when this kind of thing happens, especially fake information and fake pictures becoming viral, alongside with real information that sometimes loses credibility, the real information, because of this fake information that's co going viral. This has happened with pro-opposition and pro-government uh, supporters that has both been taking by this fake information and damage their own, their own, their own knowledge and their own ability to, to express themselves. Uh, the, the 
but the disinformation and the pictures being shared by both professionals and amateurs has led to very important discoveries of very, very dramatic abuses of power and disproportionate use of force by the state, including murder. This, this, meant, this, this has meant that now on the streets, whenever there's a protest, photographers and camerographers are commonly targeted even more than protesters themselves. This damaging information has led to a crackdown on internet censorship. This more dramatically happened last week with the blocking of Twitter images. The government blocked the serv Twitter server that, that publishes the, the images and avatars and parts of the web interface that user, users post and users need. Without this information, these damaging images were not being able to see, but to be seen by the citizens. And it actually led to a very fast uptake in uses of synchronization technologies. Uh, for example, in just the last eight days, a hospital shield had a two, million, two million new users from Venezuela, which is in a country of just over 30 million people. And not all of them using computers and being connected it's a very, very big number. Other sites being blocked are news websites, sites like Pastebin, uh, an application that works like a push-to-talk radio called Cello. And actually, with that application, it shows an increase on the sophistication of the blocking technologies being used. There is evidence that suggests that in this particular case, DPI is being used to block the use of this application. Social media is also being, being monitored heavily. So many times when a protest is being dissolved, people try to hide themselves in buildings, in apartments, in houses, and even, even in, in commerce nearby to try to avoid tear gas, uh, pellet gunshots, or being arrested. But when they cannot leave the, this place, they keep tweeting or they keep communicating with Cello, this application <coughs> I mentioned before. And oftentimes they, they tend to lead, to leave the information where they are hidden, trying to tell them, their parents, their friends, or the people from their university. And that has been used by the government to find these protesters who are no longer blocking streets, no longer being a threat to, to, to public order, but still being found and being dragged to be taken, being taken to, to prison, or at least being, t being detained. Uh, this, this is going on. This is getting worse by the minute. The amount of websites being blocked allegedly surpasses 200. Uh, this, there's a, vi a big variety of, of websites uh, being blocked at the moment. And in response to this, a coalition of NGOs and activists, are, we're going to launch, launch tomorrow a website with all the basic information about internet blocking and internet censorship in Venezuela with an online petition that I'll try to inform the most, the, the largest amount of you that I can tomorrow so that you can, you can sign it. And we, when we have enough, enough numbers, we'll take actual hard copies of that, that petition and give it to regulators and other institutions in the country to support a plea for the cease of internet censorship. Uh, if, if there's interest, I could comment more on how fake images are being used in the, gov in, in the country and how citizens try to organize themselves to stop the spread of this fake information and continue to be informed in a good way and about the kinds and the methods used to block websites. Thanks a lot, Andre. Uh, it's, it's very interesting because I see some uh, common points emerging. So from the cases that you two guys talked about, it seems that the strategy of leaks are actually being used against our individual private lives. Yeah. So basically, uh, it's exposing information that is part of your private sphere yeah, and absolutely. actually using that against you politically. You know, right? uh, in my case, it was um, probably not intended, and 
um, actually, I received a letter from uh, the Interior Ministry of Ukraine. Uh, the real address was in the address line that a criminal case was brought ag uh, against me, and there was an attachment. So I opened the attachment, and <laughs> uh, I allowed virus at my computer. H human factor. <laughs> but uh, at that time, I was ill with influenza, and I was uh, in my ho house, so they penetrated into my home computer. And they took everything they could find there. And there were personal photographs, uh, photographs of my family, my son, uh, my books that I read, my uh, articles, some paragraphs. You know, you know, I'm a journalist and I can write uh, a paragraph and leave it and think that I will return to that in future. Some projects that I plan to realize. And uh, they just created, they, uh, I don't understand how they took that through a remote commander or something like that. And uh, they exposed everything on a specially created website. They edited it to quarrel me with uh, my friends as if I discussed something and called somebody a uh, maroon or, well. Uh, but it, it didn't work, really. Uh, psychologically, it was a big blow for me, but uh, there was a really big support from the community and big understanding. And uh, you know that exactly at that time, my NGO was carrying out a campaign uh, to promote internet security. <laughs> And I was like uh, carrying out this campaign and I was uh, caught. <laughs> uh, but we had, we uh, managed to use that factor to promote the campaign. Before that invasion into my computer, people just, well, okay, there are some cyber attacks, digital, what, what's that digital security? I don't understand it. I'm not technical specialist. I have to learn something. I would not learn that, you know. But after that very bright example, they understood that, yeah, guys, digital security really matters. It really can be used against us. We immediately gathered um, <laughs> journalists in our office. I consulted with specialists and I uh, publicly told what I did wrong, what steps I shouldn't have done, and what steps should be done to prevent that. Uh, actually, it's very easy. Uh, you have just to uh, cut off internet on uh, the uh, computer which was infected, to enter th from another computer and change your passwords, and then to go to specialist. <laughs> Very easy. And um, after that, they tried to uh, attack computers of other human rights activists and other journalists, but they were not lucky. We uh, learned how to trace those attacks. We shared information inside the community. Uh, we are very grateful for the support to IFEX and uh, to a team of EFF um, because they consulted us on online. So we sent that uh, and asked, is it a virus? Can I open that letter? And they responded, yes or no, you know. <laughs> and yeah, it really such things, they, um, they matter. And uh, it appeared that in Ukraine, in a country of 46 million people, we do not have specialists on that, uh, specialists who would support uh, digital security for journalists, for human rights defenders. We did not care about that. And uh, well, after that we understood that we have to build a system of digital security among NGOs, among journalists. We have to train trainers for us, we have to train our admins for us. Um, 
It was one level of attack. Another level uh, is that under Yanukovych rule, we were under the threat or constant threat of searches. Of uh, I, I myself was interrogated several times just this autumn, uh, and uh, we really uh, the, you actually you have sources. There are means to protect information in your computer, not to be afraid of searches. Really, very easy to install TrueCrypt, for instance, on your C disk. Uh, I will not tell all the digital words, but uh, I just wanted to address uh, human rights representatives. Here at this conference, there are plenty of very good specialists and just use this opportunity and do not neglect cyber attacks. If they haven't happened to you, it doesn't mean that they will not happen in future. Uh, they will happen for sure because the world is developing and new uh, challenges are developing. So this is how it is. That's great. Uh, before we open to the audience, I just would like to hear a little bit from Richard as well about how technology can actually help the situation that you are facing because they, they've been using the press in order to, to expose you and so many other people. Does the internet provide like a, a response, like a, a, an awareness? W how do you do, do, do you think technology is important for that? Thank you. I think technology plays a very big role in this world of today. And uh, when I've talked about how social media has been a very key uh, for us to send out a word uh, we've been able to mobilize the world around uh, the global day of action against the anti-homosexuality bill, uh, which was really successful, and we're using the the media uh, uh, and social media. But how to use it effectively? I think uh, we've seen some tools that have helped us to protect our information. Uh, in 2012, in December, our offices were broken into, and all that they took was anything digital computers, recorders, and everything. And uh, in 2013, February 24th, some of the information that was on the computers that were taken from the office was published in a tabloid. And that was a wake-up call for us, and we realized that actually our information needs to be encrypted. And uh, we're able to reach out to uh, people who can help in this regard and uh, currently, to document cases of violence and discrimination, we're using uh, MATAS, uh, which is a project uh, by Benetech. So MATAS is helping us whereby you document and everything is encrypted. And uh, without the key, uh, no one could get that information. And uh, even if someone came on your laptop, they would never know that actually you're using this kind of software to uh, uh, to, to, to document or protect uh, your kind of information. Uh, we've also reached out to, for example, like um, uh, uh, thanks to Access, we are all here today, but also Access has also started a project with us whereby we're trying to ensure that uh, our information, and not only just documentation, but the entire system, how do we uh, monitor, how do we evaluate our network within the office, how are emails being sent, are they encrypted? Uh, how, what about the computer that are you using? Is it with genuine software? Uh, is it having any spyware and all that? So those are some of the things that when you look at uh, even a small basic thing like an antivirus is very, very key. Because if you do not have an antivirus, then you're actually exposing yourself to various attacks. And uh, uh, like my friend, uh, colleague here, Roxana, has talked about uh, how her laptop was uh, hacked into. So you realize that if we do not take some of those preventive measures, we are actually exposed. But then within uh, technology and the software, uh, as activists, we want immediate answers. And sometimes we have no time for details. For example, if you tell me uh, you should encrypt your email and you should do this and that, I'll say, but look, how about if I just logged on to uh, the World Wide Web and then I sent my email and then I do something else? What are, why, why are you telling me I have to get this whole Thunderbird 
or I have to get this whole uh, email to encrypt it, then you're telling me something like keys. Uh, so at the end of the day, you find that all those uh, issues or steps uh, make an activist, or a person who is uh, thinking of uh, protection and also sending a message, a give up. Can we have uh, tools that are actually also in the context that is localized uh, in regard to the activists or the, in kind of the country or kind of setting so that while we are, are providing security and uh, we are working to ensure that this tool is used, but we're also making sure that it actually fits within the context. For example, if you develop an uh, application that needs fast internet and then you bring it for an activist like me in Uganda, whose internet is going to take maybe 10 minutes to open the application. Do you think I'll use it? So I think, uh, I think we should really, as we appreciate technology, I think we should also appreciate the challenges that come with it, and also within the location and the context that we actually uh, work in. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I would like to take questions from the audience. I just would like you two guys to think about one quick question. You can answer it after we hear it from the audience, which is in a situation in which the internet is being cracked down, like in Turkey or like in a situation like Venezuela with fake profiles, the public sphere being actually manipulated by the government, who do you call? How do you mobilize if your like, basic uh, tools are actually being undermined? So I'd like you guys to think about this. What are the institutions? Is it the Supreme Court, the judiciary? Is it political mobilization? Other countries? Uh, how do you reach out? So think about that. But before you answer, I just would like to hear from the audience. So please, if anyone has a question, it's a good time to ask. Don't be shy. Please, go ahead. <coughs> Is there a microphone? There's one here. Uh, can you please ask your question there? Thank you for a really inspiring and interesting panel. My question is about dissemination of security tools. And I'm curious for you, like, how do you find these tools and how do you disseminate them and are they in languages and packages that are useful for you and your networks or uh, what means and modes would make the delivery of these tools and packages easier for you? And I've noticed that a lot of them are online, so getting them to places where the internet has been blocked or turned off seems particularly problematic and I wondered if you could comment on how you can get around those issues. Can some of you take this? Well, uh, I can answer for the for the Venezuelan case, and the dissemination of, of at least the the synchronization technologies uh, has happened just all of a sudden in Venezuela. Suddenly, when they blocked the Twitter images services, everyone was asking what to do, and in response, the very few people who had this information tried to disseminate it to um, as many people as possible. And the actual information became viral, like red tweets in the hundreds, and people just copying the information and pasting it, which came with some setbacks, because sometimes the information lost context, and you would see people like, use this, use this proxy, here's the IP, use, this with, use it with this, this part number. And, and, but without saying who's managing that server, who owns it, who runs it, is it really safe? I mean, it could be, it could be a honeypot. You, could, you shouldn't be able to, you shouldn't be, be sending the kind of information without all the context or just sending links to, to, to download software without instructions in Spanish, which of course wouldn't work for many people. Uh, many organizations uh, dedicated themselves to try to give this technology to people. So a number of websites were created with simple to use uh, instructions in Spanish with pictures so that people could follow them uh, other other organizations and even news con news websites publish inf this information as well. Uh, I think one of the one of the biggest problems 
in addition to the broadband speeds, which are very very bad in, in Venezuela, and some people some people say that there is some deliberate degradation of service going on. Uh, the problem is, what about the security of these files? You, th those files you're downloading. How how do you know someone is not putting a man in the middle attack and just putting just pretending to be this VPN provider website, and in reality you're downloading something else. So that's that's a big concern, and without without education, it's it's hard to overcome. Um, more or less the same story in Turkey, uh, nothing very different. Like translate things into your own language and disseminate, you know, basically. And they are, I mean, you can find the files everywhere. So peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, etc., etc. There's nothing new about that, but you know, this is the way to go always. I think. I think also about delivery. How could we get these tools? Uh, to the activists and how, I think one, if, because of internet issues and how to download and everything, think uh, developing like putting them on CDs or DVDs is another way like you send them over. And sometimes if you could, uh, for example, instead of uh, labeling it like, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a spyware or something, Maybe if you could name it as a, a music file or something, that could also help because there's a certain time, um, uh, this is not an example that is related to technology, but it will give us a vivid example. Uh, we had uh, a, a very good person in, uh, in Netherlands who was a very good supporter of the LGBTI movement and we're planning to do um, a Pride March. And uh, they thought of how to support and uh, they were like, okay, we are going to send you a rainbow flags. Uh, we're going to send you posters uh, so that you use them for the match. And like, wow, thank you very much. That's really nice. And we're all excited. But when they package the items, the first picture when you, could, when you open the, the package was, I am gay, come and arrest me, Uganda. So when the package was brought to the post office, it was opened. And the first thing they saw was, I am gay, come and arrest me, Uganda. So the whole package was confiscated. And uh, we had to battle it out and try to do a lot of explaining and making sure that none of us could appear at the post office, uh, office in order not to be arrested. But such an error could be avoided, whereby if you're sending this software and it's to protect, uh, we could uh, send it maybe as a music file, and we all love music, and no one would ask, because we're already having issues of uh, promotion and uh, anything that comes from uh, the West, and then it's having a whole uh, kind of uh, description, they will totally say, oh, this is how you're promoting homosexuality. And I think if we can find a way to go around it in a way that it's not provocative, but also is also not communicating exactly what is on the CD or DVD, then we'll be able to uh, send those tools to, 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 the, to the activists. And then I think there's also an issue about sending the application or software without providing some kind and form of training. Because if there is no training of how to implement the tool, then it does go, there are going to be uh, lots of challenges of how effective that tool will become. So I think while we develop, I think we should also think of mechanisms of how we can take uh, the activists or how we can take the users of these tools in uh, areas of risk uh, to learn and understand how to run these given particular tools. Thank you very much. Can maybe say yeah, something, please. yeah. Um, so maybe I want to talk a bit, a, a little bit about the body politics of this whole story. Um, so usually we talk about like files, uh, ways of privacy, security, etc., etc., which is always uh, in the knowledge level, right? But the body politics is very different, as we all experience. Um, so. <coughs> uh, 
I should give some examples of this. Like the, the first and probably the largest protest against internet censorship and surveillance happened in 2010, in July, in Istanbul. This is around 50,000 people on the street only for you know, the freedom of internet. Nothing else, nothing like freedom of expression or something else, just the internet. This is interesting. And we organized this event like, with, with, with the network of a lot of people together. And, and the reason this happened and it, with, with this many people's participation is because the use of a hybrid system, which is both the street and the internet at the same time. Not this only the street, not only the internet. You know, not the click activism, not the street protest slogans, but both. And this was a quite, I think, a strong and, and, and effective method in general. And today this is common. I think from Venezuela to Spain to Brazil to everywhere people have this hybrid activism going on. In yeah. one way or another, probably. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to just to add, yes, the same is in our country, in Ukraine, and I wanted to add uh, that if you want to um, promote internet security tools or anything, uh, how it happened in our country? We had blackouts. We had cut off internet, uh, social networks, and opinion leaders, journalists who had many followers, they told, uh, guys, use Tor. It is very easy, just download and use it. And it really had its effect. Uh, so just reach out to opinion leaders, explain them, and they will reach out to your target audience. This one way. Second way is that it should not be dull. It, should be, it shouldn't be boring. It should be fun. It should be easy and fun. Short instructions, um, infographics, I don't know, fun. And uh, I wanted to support what my colleagues have said. Uh, social networks are really a very powerful tool. Uh, right now, people in Ukraine are mobilizing in Facebook, in Twitter. Uh, we have very big community in Facebook, uh, which is organizing very big amount of things from raising money to uh, support those suffered, those injured and uh, to media community in Facebook where journalists share announcement and check reliability of the information. So social networks are really very important tool to reach communities to organize and to mobilize. Yeah. But I think we should never forget that this is both ways, you know, there's always a feedback loop, a positive feedback loop between the street and the internet. And this is the thing that causes these events to explode, you know. I mean, as you may know, in the system theory, there is that two things, like positive feedback, negative feedback. Negative feedback is for optimization. Engineers all know this very well. Uh, but positive feedback is for chaos. It generates, like, expansion, which happens in the protests everywhere, in, in the, you know, in, again, in, in these places. And I think, like, I, I will give a little example of this, what this loop is about, uh, this feedback, this positive feedback loop. For instance, when you see your friend on the street outside of this building, somewhere there, like, being detained, or, you know, maybe uh, there's a bomb, like, next to him, a gas bomb, or something like that. And, but that's your friend, you know, social networks and stuff, you are on the media. When you see this thing, it's like, you want to go outside and help him. Or people call, uh, like, you know, ask for help in the parks. They say, we occupy this park like the Wall Street uh, occupation. And come on, we need water. You know, we need food, whatever, clothes, etc. And when people bring this thing to the park, they understand, they make this connection back. The, the, the loop completes, you know. So I think in general, like, the overall the patterns we see in all these events is that there's this feedback, positive feedback loop, which generates more participation more solidarity, you know, and then uh, more, basically, uh, uh, resistance against power control. Yeah, and this is particularly important in places where diversity in media is largely non-existent, because otherwise people will be on the streets protesting, and the people who will notice or know that this is going on is just the people who live one block, two blocks away from that. Otherwise, the rest of the country, the rest of the city, wouldn't even know that this is going on there. So it's, 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 it's really key, and 
not, ha not being able to show this online, showing these pictures, uh, trying to tell what's going on on social media, if you're not able to do that, then your, your communication rights are being damaged, but it, to, to a deeper sense, the democracy itself is, is, is suffering because the, the, if, if most of the political and, and public discourse is happening online or happening in social media, then when you put barriers to social media, when you put barriers to speech online, and if that's pretty much what's left, then you're finishing off whatever's left of public, public discourse and you're seriously damaging whatever democracy you have left. So when you mentioned that the Venezuelan government was creating fake profiles, what exactly does it mean? Well, that's, that's an allegation that's, that's hard to prove, but uh, more than once, I mean, there's some, there's some examples that you could say, oh, well, somebody was probably trying to gain some attention or popularity or gain more followers with this outrageous image, but there was a point where you'll see the most outrageous images weren't coming from, I don't know, this famous picture from Egypt with, with military officers like kicking a woman that's showing uh, half undressed. I mean, that, that image is well known. Why would you post that? I mean, it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to imagine someone who's, who's an activist trying to push this as, as, a, as, a, as a, inf a picture of what's going on. Even the, the, the uniforms themselves do not match. But, and more outrageous images were being shared, and those were real images. So the allegation that has some fundaments is that it was being done deliberately to then allow public officers say, well, they're using social media to destabilize the country with this fake information and present us in a very bad light. The, the joke is that the government themselves have been subject to, to, to similar errors because their own, their own social networks have been, as well as the pro-opposition side, have been trying to show outrageous images of the other, of the other side doing right. bad things and showing the, 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 the minority of the bad actors of, the, of each side. And then those informations go viral on those networks and ministers or public officials then grab those images and post them on their own profiles. And then the, the, they end up showing yeah. fake information. As public officers on public accounts, mm -hmm. and then it gives legitimacy to something that it's basically sometimes groundless. Yeah. yeah, frequently. It's unfortunate, but we have to wrap up. So, if you can uh, very briefly uh, have your last uh, comments, I would appreciate if you could raise to some extent who do you call in a situation like that? What are the institutions that we need to reinforce? Because I, I see an underlying debate here between uh, technology as a solution, so fight fire with fire, and also uh, the question of the law being the solution, the institutions being the solution. How do you see it? Like, is, is it all about technology, institutions, both? So, Richard. Oh, thank you. I think it, it all starts from us, the individuals, uh, the human being, uh, one having a positive mind, and a mind that is, uh, in my case, that is free of uh, discrimination and hate. Uh, I think while we are using uh, technology to advocate for uh, human rights, I think we've also identified loopholes. Uh, for example, while people are going on Facebook, uh, it's again not are safe anymore because someone could pretend that they're actually gay and then before you know it uh, that the same people who have been collecting information on you and actually outing you. I think there is need to uh, look more into uh, privacy uh, for, for what kind of information that we share if we can focus on how to protect, because uh, like I've been talking about how we've been using the internet and the website as the only way to pass a message out there. If we can look into how to protect our information, not to be uh, used, because we are talking about whatever is saved in the cloud, you actually totally lose control of it. So is there a possibility that actually we could work around to make sure that whatever is saved in the cloud is secure and is actually mine and I could only share it um, with whom I choose? So basically, that's something that may not have an answer today, 
it is something that we could think about and we could look for a solution. But I think I would say that if we can support and uh, provide platforms that protect our websites from being hacked, uh, that our website can be secure so that, that the voice through which we communicate to the rest of the world and our information to go out, I think that's something that would really much appreciate. And also, I think, working together to do mobilization. Because right now, like in Uganda, we're planning to go into the Constitutional Court to challenge the Anti-Homosexuality Act that was signed by the President. And I think the coming few days or weeks are going to be tough, but we are not scared to do this. But I hope through the technology, we shall be able to share the challenges and all that is happening uh, without fail, because I know at one point they might want to interrupt uh, Twitter or Facebook as a way of communication. But if you can still have a website that is running and we can still share, then I think uh, that would be very, very good. Thank you very much. Well, I think that there are much more positive things coming from social networks, from internet, than negative. Internet is a tool, and it depends on you how do you use it. It's like telephone. Yes, you may receive a phone call with threats. So what? Block incoming calls from unknown numbers? No, use it like a tool. It is a resource for you to promote your position. I think publicity is helpful. It can come. Publi uh, uh, it can uh, help protect rights. It can help promote ideas. And we should uh, use it as, as much as possible and not be afraid. What is uh, the most important right now in my country is to defend information and is to defend the right of people to receive information. So uh, we really need protection from blackouts. We really need people uh, to get informed inside Crimea and uh, in the world. How to do that? I plan really uh, to carry out very much, very many talks right now. I'm not a technical specialist, I'm a journalist. And uh, I need uh, any ideas of how to do that technically, how to support that right of people to information, how to spread this information, how to get journalists informed, how to get human rights defenders informed. Uh, we are ready to help you arrive in Ukraine, any local assistance. Uh, we need to act to prevent war, to prevent blood and massacre. Thanks. Um, like to answer your question, like who to call, who to reach. I think in the context of Turkey, today it's impossible to, to negotiate with the government at the moment. So it's the reason because for government, internet is a shopping mall. You know, they only, the only thing they want to do is to privatize everything, if anything possible. That means like control of the ISPs, the internet connectivity, etc., etc., etc. So, like the way, I mean, you can think take from there that you can think that there is a similarity between the city, the urban condition, and the internet, right? Um, you can, you know, like the way we want public spaces, common spaces, parks, streets, etc., squares. We should have at least places like that within the internet, or at least parts of the internet should be open and free like forever, you know? So to be able to do this, I think, we should be able to, uh, we should be in solidarity with the activists of public spaces as well. Like, I mean, you know, think about this, like in the, uh, usually the, the people who are, uh, you know, resisting against the internet or like fighting against the freedom of internet, are kind of isolated from other types of resistances, which are also against, like, you know, they are fighting for human rights and stuff like that. Sometimes for, you know, uh, they fight for dispossession of neighborhoods in, the, in, you know, in the Mahales and stuff. So one way to, I think, uh, be successful in the, in the resistance of uh, the internet f freedom, we should gather our different types of resistances together, like interconnect them. Well, yeah, I have to say something that I think danger is, is already a shopping mall. I mean, you use private networks that run, they, that run your messages 
to private companies and private services. I mean, so most of the steps in that chain are private and then influenced, could be influenced by powers and governments, especially if that infrastructure is inside the government where this repression is going on. And how to defend the internet when the promise of it is, is in jeopardy, I think the answer is community. It's building communities and creating coalitions between NGOs and groups so we have enough strength to change public opinion in such a dramatic way that the people in power will have no other way but to change their policies in a way that's conducive to a human rights compatible internet and taking advantage of other communities that are outside of the, of the country, so, so, such as this community and various people who are involved and very passionate about the internet so that they can also bring that pressure from the outside so that people in policy making places, in policy making positions, feel that pressure and feel the need to follow international standards in human rights, which comes to the problem of countries that put themselves as the example of what to do with the internet, what to do with freedom online, and when they, in the end, don't, don't follow up through, when they have agendas and promote a internet freedom agendas in, in the rest of the world, but inside of their countries, whatever's going on is highly critical. So, yeah. That's great. So from the perspective of a country like Brazil, my country, I think uh, next week we will try to put the chips on the law <laughs> because the technological part of it is pretty messy, but hopefully we we'll get a, a good law that will probably try to prevent, uh, you know, difficult situations like some of those that we heard today. So I would like you to join me to thank for this brave uh, panel. Thank you so much, guys.